Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this uh, gray and, and rainy day. Uh, my name is Abigail Lewis, and I am the executive director of Bethany Arts Community. For those of you who are not familiar with Bethany, our mission is to create a space and environment where the many forms of art can be learned, produced, and flourish. A space where artists of all ages and levels of experience are welcome to explore and create art for the community to experience and engage with. Our residency program, uh, which this, today's program is part of, offers a short-term residency attracting artists from different disciplines and stages of their careers who come to us from around the world for the development of both new and works in progress. During the residence, the artists get to concentrate on their work while engaging with each other, with local artists and with the public. During this time of COVID, we've been incredibly fortunate that our facility has allowed us to continue with our residency, albeit a smaller uh, number of artists here with us uh, so that they can come and live and work together safely. Um, we have also chosen this year to launch a virtual residency program in order to include more artists. Our residency program is made possible with the generous support of the National Endowment for the Arts, New York State Council on the Arts, Arts Westchester, and with generous donations from people like yourselves, our community. So today I am very pleased to introduce Daniel Amilanis, who's been spending uh, his week here with us. Daniel is a writer and a teacher uh, he spent much of his time at Bethany working on his new uh, work of historical fiction. And today, I think Daniel is going to be sharing a little bit about uh, his process and uh, how he spent his time and uh, how he got here. So with that, Daniel, I will turn it over to you. Um, so it's really a privilege for me to be here at uh, Bethany. Um, the my journey here was really strange. And Bonnie, it's so interesting that you said that I'm a writer and a teacher because five or six years ago, I would have put that in reverse order and maybe not even mentioned the writer part. So it's been quite an adventure coming to be here now today. Um, back in uh, 2016, I think it was, I took a writing workshop and uh, given by one of my colleagues, I did then you'll be a better teacher of writers. And I thought that was a wonderful way to sort of look at yourself as a teacher and a learner. So I took the workshop and one of the, pro one of the projects was to write a narrative. And I, this sort of thing came out of me and I thought, this is, I need to do this. And when he offered the course again, I did it again. And the narrative turned out to be the first chapter of the young adult fantasy novel, which is now with my literary agent and is out on submission. So it's sort of amazing for me to even say that. Um, and so when I had, I saw the opportunity that Bethany offered a residency of 12 days to just focus on something, I thought, I have all this stuff, all these books that I've collected that I was working on for this uh, next piece of, that I had in mind, uh, historical fiction set in uh, Imperial Russia at the turn of the, um, 18th century, so 1796 to 1801 was the period that I was focused on. And so I brought all my books and uh, had the time to look at them. I'm just looking at a very short span of years for each of these books. So I don't have to read the whole book, but it, the temptation is certainly there. And of course, we've got um, the internet as well, which is an um, amazing source. And I'll try to mention that later on. So I really my day job is a teacher and I'm very committed to teaching my kindergartners and now my fifth graders uh, at the Bronx Charter School for Better Learning. So in my time here, I have had to balance some, uh, not giving up completely on my uh, other job while I'm working here. So what am I doing? So the story that I'm working on uh, first started because I heard a piece of music, classical music written by Serge Prokofiev famous for Peter and the Wolf and uh, uh, his, uh, some of his ballets, Romeo and Juliet and uh, uh, other works that are 
fairly popular. One of his works was called Lieutenant Kije. And I just love the music. If I played the sleigh ride, the Troika ride, you would all recognize the music. It's very, it's been used a lot. And in my youthful adventure, I started looking into what is the story of Lieutenant Kije? And I found out that it was a 1933 Soviet film based on a novel, which was based on a newspaper story from 1870. So I looked and I looked and I looked and here's where the, the internet and the web is so helpful. It, you can really go down any kind of rabbit hole you want. Um, so I found the sources and I was even more intrigued than I was at the beginning. Um, so that led me to this period in history uh, when Paul I of Russia, the first and the last, um, the son of Catherine the Great, everybody might know about Catherine the Great because she was so great and she put her mark on the world at the time of the enlightenment um, as it was uh, uh, during, especially during the end of that century. Um, she did not want her son Paul to become czar after her. She was dead set against it. And she wanted her grandson, Paul's son, Alexander to take the throne. Paul grew up and he was in his forties by the time his mother died. And he went into her room and he found out she was dead. He found the papers that said that Alexander should succeed her and he destroyed them. So he was very smart about how things should go. The historians have lots of different opinions about Paul. They say he might have been mad. He might have been very eccentric. He might even have been bipolar. And then some say, well, he was just um, a creature of his time and he had ideas that were not um, in lockstep with his mother. The first thing he did was pardon everybody his mother had banished which was interesting, which made for an interesting um, percolating um, voices in uh, Petersburg and Moscow at the time. Um, so the newspaper story um, was a joke, was, was making fun of Paul after he was long gone. And this um, storyteller named Dahl wrote these stories, really making fun of him, playing up on his eccentricities. And the story that caught my attention, that caught uh, Prokofiev's attention and also the novelist who turned it, the little story into a novel was this event that happened. There was a scribe writing down the names of the lieutenants and he made a mistake and he copied over some of the Russian characters. So that instead of saying, PJ, Chiche is not a name in Russian, but there is a little bird that's called Chiche, which comes into the story later. That's, my, that's what I brought to the story. So the scribe is terrified because he's made a mistake. There no, uh, there's no whiteout at the time, of course. So he's got to recopy the entire document. So he doesn't know what to do. Somebody comes in, takes the paper and says, oh, who's this Lieutenant Kije? And he doesn't want to get in trouble. So he lets it go. And so this character who doesn't exist is brought into the brigade. And when Paul, the emperor, finds out about this, he's got some generals who want to make some money. And they say, oh, well, Lieutenant Kije is a new recruit, and uh, he's very good, and he needs to be promoted. So Kije moves up through the ranks. He gets paid. The generals take the money. And it goes on and on and on, this whole sort of uh, farce of fooling the emperor until uh, Paul decides he wants to see Lieutenant Kije. And he says, bring him in. And the generals, of course, say, well, we're sorry, your eminence, he's dead. he's dead. And then there's a huge funeral for this imaginary person. So this story um, really fascinated me. And I wanted the story to be about Kije, but then to have somebody who really was Kije sort of get involved in this complicated world of royalty, somebody who was just um, a soldier. And so that's how the story evolved for me. So I took those historical events, newspaper story, and sort of wove my own story about it. But I wanted it to be based on something that was true. And that's why I wanted to do all the research. So um, I have some things to share with you um, visually um, so that we're not just listening to me. Here are some things that inspired me in terms of, um, I hope you can see that all right. So the forests of Russia are legendary, of course. 
And um, that was one of the inspirations. And then when I came to Bethany, of course, what did I see? But the, oh, there's KJ. Let me just play this. When I came here, the forests of Bethany were quite fit right in with what I was doing. So I had lots of time to take in the surroundings. When I was looking for the model for Kije, for the real person Kije, this is from a statue in New York City that's uh, for the Hungarian um, revolutionaries back in the 1800s. And the, the helmet is wrong, his hat is wrong, but that's very much how I imagined Kije would be. Um, there's that, um, th these sorts of things that influence and inspire me. And I wanted another character in the story. So I chose somebody that wasn't, that would be uh, a blacksmith in Moscow and a, uh, someone who grew up learning the trade from his father. But I didn't want everybody to be the same. So with a little bit more research, I was able to discover that um, there were people of many different ethnic backgrounds living in Europe actually at the time, all of equal stature. So I chose to make the blacksmith um, someone of African descent. And this was not uncommon in Europe at the time and, not, and, and also in Russia. That's a whole other story, but we can, I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. And then um, here's Paul himself and I, he's been made fun of a great deal and his looks are mocked. His pug nose and, or his turned up nose, his high forehead, even with the, without the wig, um, he's been really made a lot of fun of. Um, he was, as I said, he was, um, there are various opinions about him at the time. And it got to the point where his, um, the rest of the court, his generals and the other aristocrats that were around him decided that it was time for him to go. And some say his son, Alexander, the eldest son was involved. At any rate, um, one night he was horribly assassinated, choked and uh, bludgeoned uh, intentionally or not. Maybe it just got out of control. The, the circumstances are still kind of sketchy. Um, one of the things that happened with Paul was that um, he was involved, uh, as you may remember, about uh, the French Revolution that just happened. So the monarchs of France were, th were thrown out. And of course, the rest of the monarchs of, of, um, of Europe were a little nervous about that. So when Paul had the chance to perhaps invade France, he did it with the help of England. And he embarked on this mission to enter France from Holland, which was divided also at the time from uh, the loyalists who wanted to go with royalty and those who wanted to have a, a democracy. So anyway, uh, Paul aligned himself with the British. The British paid all the soldiers to go to Holland and invade. And it was a disaster. Um, the Russian troops were um, poorly organized. Um, this is an account of the adventures that happened that I was able to find. Um, there's North Holland, uh, where the adventure, this is the, the North Sea here, and this is where they came in, and it was uh, only several months, thousands of Russian soldiers, tens of thousands of British soldiers in 200 sailing ships. You can just imagine the logistics of that. And it was, and the Duke of York was involved, and it was a disaster. The, the British and Russian combined forces um, capitulated and a treaty was signed, but it was already November and the Russian troops could not go back to Russia. So the British took all the Russians to the islands, the, to the Channel Islands, Guernsey and Jersey, which is another, a wonderful wrinkle in the story uh, for me anyway, um, that there have all these rich Russians. And here's um, some of the uh, drawings of the period of 1799, if you can believe it, um, made at the time. Um, and uh, let's see, I, you, the Russians were, had very strange uniforms that Paul was very fond of, those tall, almost bishop-like miter hats 
that were impossible to you know, maneuver in and very tight breaches that were on the Prussian, model on the Prussians. So it was not an easy battle to, to fight. Uh, Holland, of course, is all dikes. And uh, that was also a problem because they weren't ready for that. So the Dutch and the French forces were able to easily overcome. Uh, I'll stop that share for a minute. Um, the, uh, and I, as I wrote this, I wasn't, um, I, the first novel that I wrote, the fantasy, the young adult fantasy novel, I wrote from beginning to end. It seemed to just pour out of me. Um, this one, because I was doing research at the time, I was writing it in different sorts of chunks. So I had beginnings and middles and remembrances and these two characters that I created, they had their own trajectory, their own arc, but then that started when they were teenagers, late in their late teens, but then they had memories also. So that was interesting. And I ended up, I'll share again. with um, a manuscript that was all over the place. Oh, when I was getting ready for today, I found this wonderfully ridiculous plan that I was going to finish writing this thing in six months. And all these, this I outlined for myself because somebody had asked me what I was play working on. So I have all this stuff that I said I was gonna do and finish, and I would finish the novel in December. Well, you see the date there, it's 2018, and here it is 2020. But I when I saw this, I remembered putting this together with these, you know, the seal of Russia and the Russian flag. And I was thinking I was so <laughs> organized, not at all. Um, so here is what uh, one of the wonderful benefits of being at Bethany, having this huge solarium to work in. And I could, I had already printed out what I had done, about 200 some pages, and I was able to lay them out. So that line down the middle, this is the trajectory of the novel. This is the, the two young men and their journey. And this is the secondary plot of the court and all the nonsense that goes on with Paul. And then, and I had to sort of figure out where the Kijay, the, the imaginary Kijay would fit in so that it would cause the maximum amount of confusion for the two heroes. And then, as I said, these young men, um, started here in, at about age 18 or 17 or 18, but they remember also what it was like growing up. So these memories that come in, um, that was that other one. And it was so beneficial, so helpful to be able to lay this out like that. Probably the single most uh, helpful thing that happened while I was here to be able to lay this out like that. And I think I have a, two, a couple more. So it's the internet. Look, I was able to find the original newspaper story from 1870, where the original story of Lieutenant Kije and Paul, the stories, stories of the time of Paul. This is, uh, this is Russian antiquity is the name, the name up here, Russian antiquity. And it was a very popular newspaper story that ran at the time. And uh, there's one more page of that, the table of contents. And then here, I don't know how much of this is of interest to you, but here's what happened at the scribe. So he wrote out, what he was supposed to write was this. He was supposed to write out, here are the list of lieutenants. And that's the Russian, this is how you say it in, in Poruchikiji, I think, something like that. But he made a mistake and he repeated, he was copying it out and then he repeated what he should not have. He repeated this, shape, this um, Cyrillic character and the rest of it. So instead of Poruchik Kije, it came out to Poruchik Kije, Lieutenant Kije. And that's how the whole um, nonsense began. And uh, well, nonsense, but of great benefit to me. <laughs> um, so I have uh, a little bit that I'd like to read of what I've done in terms of writing. Um, so if you'll bear with me, we're going back to Russia, 1796, when uh, Catherine died. 
And this is the omniscient, uh, uh, the um, narrator who is in first person, who is setting the scene for the story. His name is Bashkirov. The bells tolled, mournful and relentless. Black sheets, flags, pennants, scraps of fabric hung from every window and the Moscow streets were empty. Catherine, granddaughter, granddaughter of Peter the Great, Empress of all Russia, was dead. Her son Paul was now emperor. Moscow, Catherine's neglected, landlocked former capital, mourned her pass passing with one breath and cursed her indifference to it with the next. Meanwhile, the populace of St. Petersburg, Catherine's preferred capital, wept enough tears to overflow the Neva. And what of her son, Emperor Paul I, and last, and not for long? The rumors were spectacularly delicious or wickedly depressing. Paul played with toys and dressed his guards like Prussians, pretty, prissy, unsoldier-like uniforms and uncomfortable. That said, Paul favored Moscow. But the new emperor was not in Moscow. Catherine's body remained in St. Petersburg and the, day, and the day of the state funeral had not been, yet been announced. Paul would preside, of course. Who remembered the last time a monarch had died? Plenty of stories bounded and rebounded quietly behind the draped doors of the vacant streets. Midday in Moscow, very cold, but a rare sunny day in the middle of November. And a slight funeral procession made its way north toward the cemetery, forcing the mourning or cursing or quietly rejoicing inhabitants to their windows, then to their doors and eventually out into the street. Who dared die and steal thunder from their stalwart Catherine? And also, who sullied their time wagging their tongues about the beloved bitch of an empress? One look at the procession and all questions were answered. Behind the open carriage with the coffin walked a solitary man, tall, young, modestly dressed, and with skin nearly as black as the hearse and the draped fabric hanging along the street. His head was bare and held erect, hair cropped short, beardless, a limp in his right leg. This was Isaac Atoff, adopted son of Atoff the blacksmith. The great blacksmith was dead. Long may his son live and continue to shoe the horses of Moscow. Petersburg would have no idea who the dead man was. Yet the dead empress was forgotten in a trice as the populace of those Moscow streets mourned in earnest a truly good and exceptionally talented master craft. Son was no more. It was now Isaac Atofovich, blacksmith, soon to be known as the Negro blacksmith, Moscow's Negro blacksmith, a title said with honesty and more respect than ever the newly installed Paul I would receive. Those were different times. A young man, idling about, caught sight of the carriage, recognized who followed it, and was soon at his side. So the word. Um, Negro, as you heard, is controversial, of course, here. Um, in Russia, it was not. It was, uh, as James Weldon Johnson, the famous um, writer, um, African-American writer, said when he was in Russia in the 1870s, I believe, um, he said he was, he, was, he was merely a man. He wasn't a black man, he was a man. And so that is another part of um, what I, what is very near and dear to my heart is to bring the, that kind of diversity and um, truth to the writing. And as I said, it's, it's wonderful to find these coincidences that have happened where my idea of diversifying Imperial Russia doesn't need to be my idea because it was real. And it's wonderful to have that backed up in so many ways. Um, and I think, um, there's one other thing I'd like to read. It's a little tricky. It's from that um, 1799 um, primary source that I mentioned, the narrative of the invasion of Holland. Here's what the outside observer said as he was watching this battle take place. He wrote, the various situations in which the author himself was placed while in Holland presented him with many obvious and favorable occasions for remark of which he was not unmindful to avail himself. He was among the foremost who landed in that country and among the last who left it. 
So this person who presumes to be a historian is saying, it's a good thing I was there because look at all the things I observed. And I think that's a wonderful, um, I have to find a way to work that into the, the story because I think it's a, a fun thing to, uh, to play with in terms of language. And here's um, that omniscient, uh, omniscient narrator. Here's his opinion on the serf and the slave situation, which he was aware of. Uh, this is my uh, writing. We Russians hold our foreigners in great esteem. Those whose skin was of a darker pigmentation than our own, whose eyes were more slanted, who in short looked not like us, did not preclude our esteem. Dignitaries and all peoples from the world received equal respect. We preferred to enslave our own people. Which mattered more, race or class? Which mattered less? The history of our subjugation of the serfs hangs less heavily around our necks than the slavery imposed upon those, Af those of African descent by the West, or so we like to think. There are cracks in everyone's mirror. So thank you for your uh, undivided attention. And if there's a, and Abby, I'll turn it back to you or to uh, anyone else out there. Yes, yes. So that was, that was wonderful. Really, um, I mean, we've talked in pieces in the last couple of days, but it was really wonderful to hear you talk through the, the whole process. Um, I, I, there's one question here. Um, if you can take a few more minutes with us. Um, so the question is, how far are you willing to go from historical fact in your writing? And, and you know, how do, how do you think about, if you do think about it, how do you think about drawing that line? Such a good question. Um, as I said, uh, remarkably, what I wanted to accomplish in this or what I'm setting out to try and accomplish it hasn't been a struggle. I haven't had to stretch the truth at all. It's really quite remarkable. Um, and that the lines I just read about the serf and the slave situation, it's amazing that jo James Weldon Johnson said almost exactly the same thing, but I found out about it afterwards. So I, I feel like I'm in tune with perhaps what was going on. Um, I am stretching the, I need the time of the battle in Holland to take a little longer. So I'm stretching those months out to a couple more because I need some letters to go back and forth. And the, there was a postal system, but it, it wasn't priority overnight. So I need to stretch that out. And after I want the story to take place, but the circumstances of the hospital being built were based upon the generosity of Paul, which is a nice aspect of him to highlight. And, uh, and so I wanted to include that hospital. Not that anybody will know what the hospital is, but for my own sake, it kind of brings things together. So I'm, I'm willing to stretch the truth, um, but I haven't had to very much. Interesting, very interesting. Um, you, I, I don't know whether this is something you can talk about in, in the amount of of time we have. So if, if you feel like this is not, not a question that you can answer, please just, just let me know. But you also talked a little bit about tone and um, how reading the, the, you had one book that arrived here while you were here um, and, and kind of how that influences or makes you think about tone. Can, can you address that at all? Yes, yes. Um, it's the, so it doesn't look like much. Where is it? Oh, here it is. It doesn't look like much, but uh, because it's a reprint. But as soon as I show you the first page, well, there's that map that you saw on the slide. Um, so it is. It's just it's a facsimile of the original, um, and that's where I found this wonderful language of this observer, who thinks so much of himself. Um, well, I would too if I was in if it was 1799 and I had gotten on a ship and gone to Holland where in the midst of a battle, I feel pretty good about myself as well. Um, and he's taken upon himself this task of documenting objectively as he feels because he feels that most historians are not objective. They put too much of themselves into it. And so he sets out to do that. And, and that's his tone that I, that I read earlier. Um, it, and it's, it's the way the language is structured, the, the way 
he was writing, he's English, so he was writing in English. And I have to be careful with the translations because uh, from the Russian, anytime I use Russian, um, because there are so many ways of, of interpreting it. There was a quote that's, uh, that I found um, from that Paul said, Paul the emperor, the exact quote or what the quote was from that's been recorded. He says, duty rather than freedom was to be our watchword. And because he's talked, I have him talking to the generals, he's going to say duty gentlemen, not freedom will be our watchword. And when he says our, of course, he means the royal we. Um, so it's the, that kind of, um, uh, there's so many commas in the, in the old, uh, in some of the British that I've, there are some of the English that I've read that I have to sort of reconstruct it to make it make sense for us. Yeah. Easier for yeah. us. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, th there's one other question here about how much time do you spend on writing versus research? Is, is that it something you even have a sense of? Well, uh, what happened was I started reading about this period once I decided on what was how it was going to work. And then I thought, well, I can't write, I can't write accurately if I don't know. So then I would go and read. And I thought, I have to write some more. <laughs> so I would write some more. And then I would do research. And then with my time here, I've been able to either correct what I've written, adjust it, or take it out entirely because it's not appropriate based on what I've found. Um, there are lovely things that I've found, things that, um, that will give it a, a sense of period. What, what, what was the drink? Was it really vodka or was it something else? Was it vodka made out, of, made out of potatoes or was it made out of rye? Which is what is true, it was made out of rye. Not... not that it's true at the time. The, the dark bread that was everywhere because it was made from rye flour. Um, things like that have been wonderful discoveries. That's wonderful, very interesting. Da Daniel, I have, I have one more question. Are the, are the coyotes going to play a, play a role <laughs> in their an appearance? No, but their cousins are in the, already in the story. The wolves are, you know, Russian, Russian wolves, of course. So there are lots of wolves in the story. <laughs> wolves are a theme. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, Daniel, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and for those listening, the, the coyotes have been... Uh, serenading here uh, every night for the last um, uh, for the last week. Um, so Daniel, thank you. It's been wonderful to have you. Yeah, here. thank you. I thank appreciate you. your sharing uh, a, a kind of an inside look at, at your process. Um, and again, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we have uh, two more talks tomorrow with artists Pantina Amada and Andrea von Bajoy. Uh, so uh, those start tomorrow at noon and 12.45, so we hope you'll join us again then. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>